Good morning. I have quite a few announcements this morning, so if you bear with us for just a couple of moments, and got several meetings going to involve several people. First of all, the welcome team. Anyone and everyone who is on the welcome team, please meet with the pastor here in the sanctuary after worship is dismissed today. All adult teachers, will you please meet in Brother Curley's classroom after worship? Sunday School Council will meet this afternoon at 4 o'clock. And all your Sunday School materials are in your classrooms. So you can stop by your classroom and pick up your new Sunday School materials for this fall quarter. Golf tournament coming up September the 25th. It's getting here pretty quick. If you plan to sponsor or if you've received sponsorship from someone else, we would like for you to have that turned in by September the 12th so that we can get your name on the banner. Uh, if, if you don't make September 12th and get your name on the banner, we will still accept sponsorships and donations. Are there any other announcements at this time? Mr. Brother Eugene, just want to remind uh, our children's or our kids' ministry department about our zoo trip. The sign-in sheet should still be out on the table somewhere. So if you plan to go and the child is in grades one through six, uh, we need to get those numbers finalized. Okay. And what's the date of that trip? September the 18th. September 18th. Anyone else? Yeah, it seems that. I keep having a lot to say. <laughs> um, last, last week we announced that we would um, that we would be starting Sunday school next week. Well, <laughs> I'm just I'm just not comfortable with that. Uh, I hope you're not comfortable with that. Uh, I will uh, the, the Sunday school leadership and I we will have a meeting this evening and we'll discuss uh, Sunday school uh, then. But as of right now, we might want to see this, this um, infection rates get to the point to where it's topped out and it's going to be on its downward uh, trip before we actually uh, go forward. So um, let's be, continue to be praying, continue to stay as safe as we possibly can. But, but right now it's on hold. If, you, uh, if something changes before, we have, before you see me again in worship service, uh, just listen to the calls. We'll be sending the calls out. Thank you, Pastor. Anyone else? Thank you. Good morning, this Lord's Day. What a privilege it is to be here, isn't it, this morning? Who's excited? <laughs> Clap your hands, shout if you're excited. Okay, no shouting. All right, I forgot I'm Baptist. You have to forgive me. If you would, I invite you to stand and sing with us, worship through song. As we sing, I want my Lord to be satisfied with me.
what heaven means to me.
may be seated. Good morning, Rita Branch. Good morning. It's good to be back in God's house. And we have visitors with us this morning. We're glad to have you here with us. I hope each and every one of you is glad to be here this morning. Back in God's house once again. To come and worship God in truth and in spirit. So if you have your Bibles and want to follow along with me this morning. I'll be reading from Ecclesiastics, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Wise words from the man saw. God's servant. Ecclesiastics, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I think sometimes we forget this uh, advice that Solomon has here for us. Fear God, keep your vows. In verse 1 here, he says, Walk prudently when you go to the house of God. And what he's saying is, behave yourself when you go to the house of God. It's very important. And draw near to hear Rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they that they do evil. When he says here, pay attention. Here. Not just let it go through your one side of your ears and out the other. Hear what the word has to say. When we come into this place, we come into the presence of He the Holy Spirit. So do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything. Hastily before God. You're in his presence here. Be careful what you say in the house of God. Not only in the house of God. But through your daily life. For God is in heaven. And you on earth. God is righteous. Yes we're still here on earth. We're prone to sin. So he's telling us be careful. Therefore let your words be few. For, drink, for dreams come through much activity. And a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For, for he has no ple pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. And we, have a, we have an example of that in, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 1. Ananias and his wife Sar Sarai, they sold a, a piece of their land, some property. They took it, the money, and take, get, brought it to the apostles. And they didn't give all the money. But Peter asked. Why, Peter asked. Why have you allowed the devil to tempt you? Because they didn't give all. That they had. That they said they had given. And. God took Ananias' life. And when his wife wasn't there. And when she came. he uh, Peter asked her. Or was it true that you gave all that you uh, had got for the land? And she agreed with what her husband had said, and she fell dead also. So it's very important. When we make a vow to God that we keep it. If you're not going to keep it, don't make it. And he goes on to say, better, better not to vow than to vow and not pay it. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the mess, mess, messenger of God that it was an error. And the messenger of God is he, the Holy Spirit. Why should God be angry at your excuse and, and destroy the works of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there is also vanity, but fear of God. And what he's saying is, when we come before God, we come in this place, reverence God because of who he is. Be careful of what you say. Yeah. Any prayer requests? We do, to, we do want to remember Brother Robin Hunt's family. Brother Robin passed away this morning. Uh, so do let's keep this for Lee and 
and his, his uh, the rest of his family in our prayer. Also, we want to keep Miss Miss Hannah Jacobs in our prayers. Her brother, Mr. Gilbert Hunt, passed away this morning also. Uh, <coughs> my husband's niece, Loretta, she died this morning also. Uh, we Roger, um, I have a prayer praise this morning. First of all, I'd like to thank the church for praying for Kay. Yes. He went back to the doctor Thursday, and the doctor saw the bone. The bone has started back to what was his hand. Amen. So we are so thankful. God is still in the healing business. Yes, he Amen. And not only my grandchild, there's a Miss Angelica McIntyre's baby. He's, he's a baby, and he's in the hospital in Chapel Hill with RSV. So let's remember that family this morning. God heal that baby also. Amen. Any other? Brother Roger, let's also remember Brother Jerry and his family. His brother is in the hospital. He's doing doing better. He's improved. But um, let's do keep his family in our prayers. Brother Roger, I'd like to uh, just pray for our county. Uh, if we look at the numbers as it relates to this COVID, uh, Natives are are leading the pack. Uh, there's more more natives getting affected than, than any other race right at the moment, and we can change that. Uh, I encourage those that hasn't got the vaccine to please get the vaccine. Uh, we prayed and prayed for God to send us something to get rid of this thing. Now that He has done it, I feel that. Uh, please just trust him that, uh, and just get shot. I mean, it's really easy. do all we can do to help fight this thing. Get shot. Thank you. Brother Roger, remember the uh, family of Frances Hunt. She's still in hospice, holding on. But so, uh, be much prayer for her family. Brother Roger, I have a cousin and her husband never had with COVID. He's in the hospital with Duke because he had a lung transplant a few years ago. So I just remember that family. I just want to say that I was going to work Monday and went down the road and I just had a little and I saw this limb sort of coming down on the left hand side. And then I realized I saw some Something going on there during the and I thought, my gosh, that's a power line. And I was going to stop. You know, it's strange how many things can go through your mind. Yeah. These minutes, for seconds, really. So, I thought, you know, where am I going to go? I knew I would get to stop and, and miss it. So, as I was going, I could see this side was still higher up for the line. So I just swerved over. Thank God I missed it. Thank you. I didn't know if I was going to get caught up in it or not. I almost lost control of my car. But thank God it didn't. Amen. 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 And I just want to thank you this morning. Yes. Mm. Mr. Carroll, so many times. Yes. Mm. on the throne, ain't he?
Amen. Any others? Brother Henry, we stand and lead us in prayer, please. Oh, God, we thank you, Father. for the favor to be in your mm. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you for the fellowship and the family that we feel here this morning. Yes. The love that's already been shared, Mary, and proclaim that we here love one another. Yes. Mm. Just thank you. Our pastor, for all the members here, Lord, what they do, the bond that they have together, Lord, just thank you this morning, Lord, and touch, Father. Touch these counties, brothers. Yes, Father. Yes, come together and see if we need to do something, Lord. Everyone used to be around the country, but now it's the next door, mm. down the street, mm. across the river. They passed away last night, Lord. I met my cousin, his wife. People that you know, you've known all your life, Lord. Lord, just touch this time of the day. Yes. Touch the church, touch the question we asked this morning, the family, the lost loved ones. Yes. The sickness, let's touch Brother Mark this morning, Lord. Mm. Just touch him in a mighty Jesus. way. Yes. yes. Just touch the Lord. We thank you this day. Thank you, Lord. We'll give you the praise and the glory yes. forever and ever. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 All I can see is thank you, Lord. Any good. Thank you, Lord. Sing with us that same spirit. Jesus said.
As you can see, it is a high and holy day. It's a day when we will observe the Lord's Supper. We just thank God that he has instituted this and given this to us and given us the privilege to take part in his supper. Um, as you're turning your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, if you would turn to Jeremiah 31. For our reading, we're going to look at verses 31 through 34. 
sitting there thinking that I probably should have used this as my illustration and read from a different text. But nevertheless, we're here in our preparation in uh, verses 31 through 34 in the 31st chapter of the book of Jeremiah. While you're turning there, I want to ask that that you be very patient (laughs) with us. Um, You know, these guys that are at the doors, the the lists that are there, I've put those lists there. Uh, I, I want you to know that I'm not trying to see who has the vaccine. I'm trying to see how many numbers in our church. <laughs> I'm trying to see if we have a herd immunity within our church. So, and that changes every week because we have different numbers every week. And we have different people every week. It's a lot of the same, mostly of the same, but there are some who will be here next week that wasn't here today and some who's here today that wasn't here last week so just be patient with us we're not trying to get in your business all we're trying to do is see if we have 70 75 80 85 percent vaccinated in the church um i'm looking at numbers not names the the problem with that is we have to we have to we have to know (laughs) we have to know who is in order to know that information so don't look at these guys sideways when they when you come in if they ask you i know they're getting tired of asking but this is this is for information for us uh, so that we know how we can proceed we we said last week we got to learn how to live with covid don't we so we've got to have these numbers to know how to make decisions on how we can proceed to continue to live with COVID. Also, I want to share as you are finding your place in Jeremiah. Um, the Lumbee tribe, in partnership with pastors, uh, on Friday, uh, put together a video. I am on that video. Uh, I gave my name, the church I pastor, and and shared that me and my family we have been vaccinated. That's the message I shared. This message will be on Facebook and you will see other pastors across denominational lines from the United Methodists to the Southern Baptists to the um, Holiness Methodist pastors. Uh, We had a Holiness pastor there and and that was the message uh, that we've been vaccinated. Now, I said last week, vaccinations are a choice, and it should be a choice. We are encouraging folks to be vaccinated. That's all we're doing. That's the purpose of this video. Now, the tribe has a slogan, and that slogan is, this shot is your shield, or this shot is my shield. Now, we did say that slogan together. It was clarified by one of the pastors, and we know, and I want you to hear this from me, God is my shield. He is my shield. So you may hear, we understand the ones that that were a part of this. We understand there's going to be some backlash throughout the community. There are pastors who don't feel the way we do about this vaccine. And that's fine. They have that privilege. But if someone comes to you and says, you got a pastor that don't trust God, let them know I trust God with everything within me. I wouldn't have took that vaccine if I didn't trust God. Just as some people are trusting God to keep them from the virus, I trust God that he gave us the vaccine to help us stay from this virus. Now that's where I'm at with it. So if anybody comes with comes to choose sideways about me, you can share that with them. I'm not defending myself. I really, I could care less what people think about me and the vaccine right now. I'm not going to be divided with people about it. If people don't want to get the vaccine, I'm not fussing and fighting with them. But this is something that I believe in. And I believe God has given it to us. Uh, now, that, that's just my perspective. And uh, I know we'll, we'll get some backlash, but it'll be okay. <laughs> it'll be okay. You believe it'll be okay? 
It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Uh, as we think, as we look here in this passage, let's read this, this, this verse. I don't want to stand before you too long today. I want to go ahead into the message. Um, verse 31 through 34 in chapter 31 of Jeremiah. The Bible says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day. I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. And their sin I will remember no more. This is God's holy word. God, we thank you for your promise to us. We thank you for your blessings that you've given us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that we sense in a powerful way in this place today. Now, God, have your way with this service. God, bless this service as we partake in your supper today. And God, we'll give you praise for all that's accomplished. God, we know you're able and you're willing to forgive those who don't know you through your son, Jesus Christ. We know you're able and willing to bring them into the fold if they would call upon the name of the Lord. So today, God, we pray that the Holy Spirit would convict their hearts, their minds. And God, that the day that they would repent of their sins and call out to you and become your child. Oh God, we know that's your desire. God, help that to be our desire. Help that to be the desire of those who don't know you today. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. When we look in Jeremiah's writing, we find this prophecy. And, and here we're looking all the way in chapter 31. If we go throughout Jeremiah's writings, we find there's a section where Jeremiah pleads to the children of Israel to... Turn from their wicked ways or God's going to bring judgment upon them. Then Jeremiah uh, lets them know that because you haven't turned from your wickedness, God's going to bring judgment upon you. And judgment begins and, and Jeremiah also shares with them some words of encouragement through, uh, through his prophecy. If you get to chapter 29, 30, and 31, you find a lot of encouragement. Even though they're hearing, they've heard from Jeremiah, because of your sin, because of your continued neglect, of God because you've went after other gods and you've and you've denied God because you have you have denied the prophets that God has sent to you God's going to send you into captivity he's going to take your land away from you your land will be desolate it will be destroyed your temple will be brought down to ruins he's told them all of this and in chapter 29 Chapter 30 and chapter 31, we find hope. Jeremiah shares with them the grace of God in the fact that they're going to be they're going to be placed in captivity. We may wonder, where is grace there? Well, the grace is the fact that God gave them a number of years. That is grace. What that tells me is it ain't going to last for always. That there's coming a day when it's going to get better. He told them for 70 years they would be in captivity. That led them to know after 70 years, because God is God and God is in control, he's going to bring them out of that captivity. I want to tell us that's the grace of God. 
That's the love of God. That's God letting us know that there's coming a day when things will get better. And I know right now in this life, in this day we're living in, things seem to be a little dark. Things seem to be getting dim. It seems like on every hand we're, we're hearing things we just don't want to hear. But I got news for us. There's coming a day when it's going to get better. I can't tell you when, but I know soon and very soon our, our soon coming king, he's on his way and he's going to come to take us out of this mess. Yes, when we come to chapter, these chapters, we find such hope in them that, that they don't have to worry about their captivity for always. Now, their sin put them in captivity. But while in captivity, they're instructed to move forward. If you, if you were to look in chapter 29, verse 5, you would find that they were told to settle down, to build and to plant gardens. If you look in, in verse 3 of that same chapter, we would find that they were told to marry and, and start families and, 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 and have children and, and, and populate their, themselves. They were told in verse 7 to seek the peace and the prosperity of Babylon. Oh, that may not make sense to a lot of us, but the children of Israel being overtaken by Babylon, taken into, into captivity by, into Babylon and and God is saying, seek peace for them. And the reason is, if things are going well in Babylon, things are going well for those who are captive in Babylon. So their welfare was tied to the prosperity of Babylon, and they were told to seek God to grant peace to them. Basically, they were told to settle down because they were going to be there for a while. They would be there for 70 years years. Well, in chapter 30, what we find is God uses Jeremiah to share that after their captivity, Israel will be restored. Though it would be in ruins, it would be raised up again. And we've been studying that through in, in Bible study, through the books of, of Ezra and Esther and Nehemiah. And here, before they even began their ministries, Jeremiah's prophesying that it will take place. In chapter 31, God uses Jeremiah to share with that Israel will be rebuilt again. In verse 30, I mean in verse 3 of 31, Jeremiah said, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt. Here what we see. I, I don't know if you see this, but God is sharing with them. I've never left you. You've never been by yourself. I've been right there with you. And I don't know. Somebody might need to hear this today, but I don't know what you've been through this week. I don't know what the circumstances of this week has, has been for you, but what I do know, no matter how bad it may have been, God has seen you through because he hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. He's been right there with you. When we think about this that's taking place, Jeremiah is prophesying under an old covenant. And because it's an old covenant, there's problems with that covenant. When we look today, we see the prom in today's passage over in 31, we see the promise of a new covenant. And there wouldn't be a new covenant or the promise of a new covenant if there wasn't something wrong with the old covenant. So as we look here, we need to understand the problem with the old covenant. At the time of Jeremiah's prophecy, Israel was under the Mosaic covenant. We know that as the law of Moses, the old covenant. Uh, it, 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 it came into play or during the Exodus time with Israel. And this was a conditional covenant. They, their, their salvation was based upon the blood of lambs being offered up to God for a sacrifice for those who wanted to approach God. This was basically a works-based covenant. Well, it didn't take very long 
when this covenant was instituted to really understand that the Mosaic covenant would one day be replaced with a new covenant. This is evident in the fact that before Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the commandments of God, the Israelites had already broke the first two commandments. Many would say that, well, they didn't know the commandments, so they can't be held accountable to their actions at that time for breaking the commandments. Well, the fact that the first commandment states that you shall have no other God before me, and the second commandment instructs us to, to not make for us a, a graven or a carved image, it should have been no brainers for Israel. We have to remember they had been in bondage for 400 years, and God heard the cries of his people. People. And God came on the scene through Moses. He used Moses to perform many miracles there in Egypt. And the final miracle, which brought them out of Egypt, and that wasn't enough. God continued to use Moses to, to show the people that he was God. In the fact that they were caught between the Red Sea and the army of Egypt coming behind them. And God parted the waters. They walked across on dry ground. And God covered up and drowned the Egyptian soldiers. It wasn't just that. They wandered in a wilderness for 40 days and 40, I mean, for 40 years, never having to change their shoes. I want to tell you, that's a miracle within itself. I have to change mine every couple years. There's holes in them. They begin to blister and hurt my feet. I can't walk in them very good after so long. But here for 40 years, they didn't have to change their shoes. I want to tell you, God was in the midst of these people and they still fail to honor God here they are can you imagine being with them and seeing all the water in Egypt turn to blood could you imagine seeing them overtaken by locusts could you imagine seeing them being overtaken by frogs and other uh, things? Can you imagine walking around and you see people with boils all over them? You saw all of the, the plagues that came upon e Egypt. And then all of a sudden, Moses says, go home, prepare a lamb without spot and without blemish. And take the blood of that lamb and place it over the doorpost and the lintel. And the death angel will pass by. And throughout the night they had to hear the cries and the wails of people who didn't believe God. But even in the midst of that they saw the grace of God that he had passed by because their home was covered by the blood. I want to tell you there should have been no reason any of them would have doubted God in that wilderness. Amen. But they did. They did. That, it wasn't, this wasn't the case that they would just believe. Even after the account in Mount Sinai, down through the centuries, in every generation, the Israelites broke the commandments of God. They failed to keep the terms of a covenant which they agreed with, a covenant that they said would be the pattern for their lives. How did they break it? Well, in Jeremiah 5 and 2, it tells, us, it, it tells us that they bore false witness. In Jeremiah 5 and 8, it tells us that they engaged in adultery. In Jeremiah 5 and 12, it tells us that they denied God's worth as the truth. In Jeremiah 5 and 13, it tells us that they persecuted God's prophets. The Israelites broke the covenant. And by breaking the commandments of God, it, they were in no way able to please God. You know what? So has every, every human being born throughout history. We have broken the commandments of God. If you're sitting there saying, preacher, I, you don't know me that well, get over yourself. You've broken the commandments of God. Romans 3 and 23 tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I love that little word, all, because it puts me in there and it puts you in there. With this in mind, if, we, if, the, if the only way we can come to God is to come to God through an old covenant, then we would all be cursed, wouldn't we? So we must ask the question, 
if we're unable to become righteous and acceptable to God through the law, why then would God give us this old covenant? Why would God give us this covenant of the law? Is it possible that God knew that we would think that we were so good <laughs> that he would have to accept us? <laughs> well, if there, if there is none good but the Father in heaven, which scripture says, is it possible? Is it possible that God gave us the law to make us aware of our sin? To make us aware of the condemnation that we have before us? Is it possible that God wanted us to become aware that we cannot boast within our own righteousness? Is it possible that God wanted us to come to the realization that we are sinners in need of a Savior? Amen. Romans 3 and 20 tells us, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, God gave us the law so that we would know that we are sinners. So that we would know that we would be redeemed. God gave us the old covenant so we would know that we needed help. That outside of ourselves, there has to be someone who is greater than us that could deliver us, that could redeem us, that could forgive us of our sins. God used the old covenant to point us to a new covenant. He used the old covenant to point us to our need of forgiveness, our need to be redeemed, our need to, for salvation. This is not a need just for the Jews, which the old covenant was for, but this is a need for the entire world. Galatians 3 and 24 tells us, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. God has no interest in us serving him through force. Aren't you glad? Amen. There are some in this world I wished I could force to serve him. I wished I could. Boy, it breaks my heart to know that people are leaving this world and going into eternity without Jesus. But I'm so glad God fixed it the way he fixed it. You know why? Because if I would, I, I know how I am. <laughs> Which tells me a lot of you may be like me. There's some of you here who, when you're told you got to do something, <laughs> something some, this little thing called rebellion arise up and say, I'll show you. There, there's, some, there, there's, there's enough of that in all of us that if God forced us to serve him, we'd do it begrudgingly. We'd do it not, we would do it not wanting to. And you know, there's a picture of that during the millennial reign. Because during the millennial reign, when Christ reigns for a thousand years, everybody will be obedient to Christ. He's not coming back as a lamb. He's coming back as a lion out of the tribe of Judah. He's coming back to sit on his throne and to rule and to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. And everybody will follow his command, but everybody will not trust him. As their Lord and Savior. I'm so glad he's fixed it. To where he's given us a choice. The choice to realize who we are. Without him. And who we can be with him. Because when we realize who we are without him. And who he makes us with him. We want to serve him. Yes. Yes. God desires for, he desires and he longs after us to have a relationship with him. Besides, he took the time to create us. Every animal of the land, every animal of the sea, he spoke them into existence. But you and I, he didn't do that. He loved you so much that he reached down from heaven and formed us out of the dust of the ground. If that weren't enough for you, he formed us in his image and in his likeness. And if that's not enough for you, he reached out of heaven and blew into our nostrils. And we became a living soul. No other did he take that much time with but you and I. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> God knew that we could not and would not please him through the old covenant. So he gave us a new covenant. One 
in which we could be made right with him. A covenant in which we could become the sons and the daughters of God. There's power. <laughs> power in this new covenant. It's a, it's a more powerful covenant than the old covenant. Because in the new covenant, God is the source of the new covenant. God identifies himself as the source of the new covenant. In New King James, we see six times. I think in the King James, you might see it five times. Uh, where Jesus, where God says, I will. In verses 31 through 34. As a matter of fact, in verse 31, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. If you go to verse 33, it says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their, in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin and I will remember no more God is the source of this not you and I not Moses not Jeremiah not Matthew Mark Luke or John not Paul not Peter but God is the source of this new covenant While God is the source of the new covenant, the true believers of Israel and Judah would be recipients of the new covenant. However, the new covenant would not be limited to only the Jews of Israel and Judah. The New Testament makes it clear that the new covenant was based upon the promised Messiah to come, the anointed one, the savior of the world. And because he's the savior of the world, this covenant would be offered up to whosoever will. Oh, aren't you glad you fall into that? At the Passover, before Israel left, they were instructed to kill this spotless lamb. We shared that. They were to take the blood of the lamb, put it on the doorpost, put it on the lentils, and the death angel would pass by if it saw the blood. But this blood was not sufficient. Each time Israel sinned, the blood of bulls, goats, lambs, or birds had to be spilled. A new sacrifice had to be offered up. But God had a plan. In his new covenant, Jesus Christ would come, from, come to this sin-cursed world. He would live a sinless life. He would perfectly obey his heavenly father. He would be justified to be the once and for all sacrifice for the sin of the world. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus shed his blood. His blood was sufficient to redeem all men, Jew and Gentile alike. On the cross, Jesus made it clear that his blood was sufficient for he said it is finished there never need to be another sacrifice Jesus will never go back on a cross that one that one time where he poured out King James says he shed his blood he poured out his blood for the sin of the world oh and by Christ being the only sufficient sacrifice for sin we now can come to God by faith in the finished work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we place our faith in Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we become partakers of the new covenant. This is the covenant of faith. It's not a covenant of works. But do not be mistaken. This does not negate our responsibility to obey God's commands. Jesus did not come into this world to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. He demonstrated to us that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. He demonstrated to us that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And if we will keep these two commandments, we fulfill all the commandments. And it's when we... Fulfill the commandments of God that the world will know that we love him. <laughs> 
But not only do we notice that God's the source of the new covenant, we also notice he's responsible. We see his responsibility in the new covenant covenant God takes the responsibility to establish listen to me don't miss this God takes the responsibility to establish a personal relationship with those who put their faith in Christ Jesus God does this through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit once we place our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit is quickened. He is made alive within us. And through, and through this, we become born again. And God begins a work in us through the power of his Holy Spirit to make us more like Christ. Romans 8 and 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He creates in us a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, God then begins to lead us and guide us by teaching us his truth of his word and he stirs us to obey his commands and it's when we sin against God we, that we break God's heart and when the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of our sins and stirs us to confess our sins to repent of our sins and to renew our fellowship with him for in 1 John 1 and 9 it says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness it's through faith in Jesus Christ, who is our mediator between us and God. We can't get to God no other way but through him. And because we can get to God through him, we have access to the presence of God the Father. And because we have access to his presence, we're able to live in an unbroken fellowship with him. But well, the Bible tells us <laughs> that we are to continually, continually confess our sins. Listen, I want us to really understand our responsibility in this new covenant. Is to place our faith in God's only begotten son. Our Lord, our Savior. Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility. Because if we genuinely place our faith in him, we will seek to serve him. We will want to please him with because of all, not because we have to, but because of all he's done for us. We will seek to serve him out of gratitude, not out of force. For it was Jesus who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made of himself no reputation, coming, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And he was found in appearance as a man. And he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Folks, our responsibility... Listen to me, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, your responsibility to have access to God under this new covenant is to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God's responsibility is to give the believers in Christ Jesus a new birth. God's responsibility is to make us a new creation. For the old things are passed away and all things become new. And that's done through his Holy Spirit. God sends his spirit to abide with us and to stir up our hearts to please him. By obeying him and fellowshipping with him and confessing our sins to him. Let's not mix this up and think that we 
are to do God's part. We have a part to do, and that is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of our sins, and confess Him as our Lord and Savior. That is our part, and He's going to do the rest. But genuine repentance and genuine faith in Christ is evident. James says, <laughs> James says, show me your works and I'll show you your faith. Because faith without works is dead. In other words, under this new covenant, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you will love him so much that you'll want to serve him. And those who can willfully sin without any conviction of the power of the Holy Spirit, they've never been saved. It's not a matter of them being in a backslidden condition. A backslider experiences conviction. But one who's never been saved, they can sin and be okay with it. I wonder where you are today. Is every head bowed, every eyes closed? I wonder where are you? Are you in a place to where you know you know that you are a partaker of the new covenant? That you know you've been born again, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If you are, you're welcome to this table today. You're welcome to take part in the Lord's Supper. And I pray that you've already received your elements. But if you're here today, and you're part of those who can willfully sin, and there's no conviction. I'm not talking about there's no, that your conscience is bothering you. I'm talking about conviction where the Holy Spirit is grieved within you. And he's telling you to repent. Oh, I want to encourage you to repent. Renew your fellowship with God. Restore your relationship with God. If you're in a backslidden condition, that's all you have to do is just repent of your sins. Your name's been written, but you need to repent of your sins. As David said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. But if you're lost and without a Savior, if you've never confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never truly been born again, Oh, you need to repent. But you need to believe in whom you're repenting to. You need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And if you believe this, that is the hard part. If you believe He is God's only begotten Son, that He came to earth and lived the sinless life and He died for the sin of the world, He arose on the third day, and he's ascended back to the Father and he's coming back to receive his, his bride. If you believe this, then the question is, are you ready to confess your sins to him? Repent of them and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then confess him to the world that he belongs to you and you belong to him. Every head bowed, every eyes closed right now. Where are you today? Where are you today? If you're here and you have unconfessed sin in your life, oh, this is a great time to just talk with God deal with God reason with him 
seek his forgiveness. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I would encourage you, do not take part in this supper. For sickness and death can come to you if you take part of it unworthy. If you take part of it not knowing Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if you're ready right now, we'll put this off for a few moments. If you're ready to say that I believe Jesus is, my, is the Savior of the world. I confess my sin to him. And I make him my Lord. If you're ready, while everyone's praying, while every head's bowed, every eye's closed, would you come? Would you come and let me introduce you to Jesus? If you'll step out in faith, he'll meet you and walk with you here. And I'm convinced you'll be saved by the time you get here. Would you? Because then you'll be welcome to this table. Would you come? Would you come? Would you come? Is there one? God, as we come before you right now, as hearts are praying, God, we just want to thank you for the new covenant that we have in Jesus. God, we want to thank you that it was his blood that was poured out on Calvary's cross to grant us forgiveness of our sin, to where we could become the children of God. Oh God, we thank you for loving us in ways we can't even imagine. So now God, I pray that you would move and minister upon this congregation right now. As there may be someone confessing their sin to you, repenting of their sin, God, I pray that you'd give them a joy that's unspeakable. Peace that the world can't give and the world can't take away. Oh, assurance that you've never left them you've never forsaken them and God if there's one who's never known you through your son Jesus Christ I pray right now that you minister to them that you move upon their hearts and that God you help them to see their need for a savior and God that you would give them the courage the faith to call out to you and ask what must I do to be saved Oh God, move upon them right now. And we'll praise you for what's accomplished. Oh God, we're trusting you this day. We're depending on you. or one. God, as we do come before you, we thank you for this time, this portion of our service. God, the word we come to remember your supper. The word we come to remember all that you have done for us. Oh God, we give you praise this day for allowing us to be able to participate in such a lovely event as this. An event that has lasted throughout the ages. Oh God, we pray that we will never be able to forget the significance of a day like today. A supper like this. To where you, God, gave your son. And in obedience, he sacrificed his life. So that we could have a right to the tree of life oh God we thank you 
that in humility, in suffering and anguish, he was broken. But in victory, he arose. Oh God, while on the cross, while dying and pouring out his blood, he was giving us victory. Providing forgiveness for us so that we could come to your throne boldly. So that we could come into your presence and we could know you in an intimate way. Oh God, we love you this day. And we thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Brother Marcus, will you help me uncover this? moment to be able to share in this supper we remember the story the account it tells us that Jesus had told his disciples to go prepare a room and as they went and prepared it they come Jesus took the time to wash their feet Showing himself to be a servant to them. Showing them that their duty was to serve others. Peter, in humility, said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. But Jesus said, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part of me. Peter said, then wash me from head to toe. <laughs> but Jesus had a better plan <laughs> than water and a cloth <laughs> from head to toe. What they didn't know was things were in place for him to go to be arrested. Things were in place for him to be illegally tried. Things were in place for him to be tied to a whipping post. For him to have to carry a cross up Galgotha's hill. For him to be nailed to a cross and suspended between heaven and earth. Things were already moving in place. Jesus, as they sat around that table, knowing what was before him, took the bread. And he blessed it. Brother Michael, would you stand and pray over this bread? Praise the Father again, Lord. It is time. We remain on that day. Father, we are not worthy that you make us worthy this morning. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us, for you brought us through the Lord. Father, as the pastor said yesterday, Father, these trials and tribulations out there. Father, you're the one that's over all because you're the creator. You made it possible for us to be here today. Yes. Father, just take this bread from the Lord and just bless it. May it run through our body and our soul like the Holy Spirit. Father, it's the morning. Amen. He broke it 
and he gave it to them and he said eat for this is my body and after they had eaten the bread he took the cup and he blessed it brother Roger would you stand and pray over the cup gave them the cup and said drink for this is my blood of the new covenant without his blood there would be no new covenant because his blood has the power to wash away sin there's nothing can cleanse us but the sin cleansing power of the blood of Jesus drink <sighs> the Bible tells us that they left that night rejoicing and singing a hymn so today we're going to stand. Brother Marcus, you got him to lead us in. As you depart today, just know that, that I love you, but Jesus loves you so much more. If you know him, continue to serve him. If you don't, get to know him for he is a soon coming king